having a strong prayer life will forever change your life. So here are the top 10 tips to make you a prayer warrior to get the same things that you see in the Bible in your life. So number 10, start with the cross. Start by beholding the nails in Jesus' hands, his feet, the piercing in his side, and the blood of the lamb. So this is a reference to Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. It says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So to have a deep richness in your prayer, if you start at Jesus, you cannot go wrong. So in the Old Testament, to enter into the dwelling place of the holy of holy, uh, the tabernacle, and basically a foreshadowing of worship and prayer, you had to start at the altar. And so definitely read the Old Testament and study the tabernacle, but a book, great book, I think the best book I've ever read on prayer and on worship is How to Worship a King by Zach Neese, description link below in the description. This book taught me so much about prayer um, and, and worship in the scripture to know how to posture yourself, to hear from God, be led by the Holy Spirit, and just to understand just the wisdom that are, or is already available in the Bible. Number nine, pray on your knees. So one of the things that I learned from the book, How to Worship a King by Zach Neese, is the word worship. The word worship in the Hebrew has several meanings. One means to serve. One means to kiss hands and adore. And another one means to lay prostrate. So one of the things that we have lost, especially in modern times, is that you actually have to prostrate yourself in prayer. So it says that Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time in James chapter 5. But also in the gospel of Matthew, it says to worship the Lord your God of all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So the strength part of worshiping God in prayer is the body. And so you will find that as your body goes, your soul, spirit, mind, emotions will follow. So if I humble myself in prayer, so this is being on your knees or bowing or laying prostrate, you'll find that there is a richness that you cannot get by sitting. Nowhere in the Bible it says that they pray to God or worship God by sitting because in short, there is no reverence. And so if you posture yourself in humility, it says that the grace of God will come upon you. And so that is a huge aspect that I really want people to get when it comes to how to pray. Roll out of bed, get on your knees, and you'll find yourself not falling asleep while praying also. Number eight, which actually should have been the first one, you must be born again. So this is John chapter four. It says that God is looking for worshipers who will worship him in his spirit and in truth. And this is John chapter nine. It says that we know that God does not hear sinners, but if any person be a worshiper of God, he will hear their prayers, all right? So it says right there, you can now live a life of sin, but you need to live a life of holiness. And how do you have a life of holiness? by being born again, receiving the Holy Spirit. So how do you receive a life of holiness? By receiving the Holy Spirit. Once you're born again, prayer becomes so much easier because again, you must worship him in spirit. So when you're in sin, you're not a Christian, you're dead. You are spiritually dead. But once you're born again, you are made spiritually alive. And part of that being alive is prayer. And so one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is love. So that is love for good works, service, the brethren, other Christians, and prayer. So a lack of desire, prayer could also be a lack 
being born again. I'm just being honest. And so there's actually a pretty <laughs> interesting story in church history when it comes to John Wesley and Charles Wesley. These are revivalists for the Great Awakening in the United States. It said that they came from Great Britain. They were Methodists is where your Methodist church comes from. And they will wake up at 4 a.m. They will pray and read their Bible. But until they met George Whitfield, which is one of the biggest fathers of the faith, everyone comes out of church revival from the UK, Charles Spurgeon, and the United States, George Whitfield. They said that until they prayed with George Whitfield and read the book, The Life of God and the Soul of Men by Henry Scruble, they were doing all that and they were not saved. These men said that they were not saved. They read the Bible. They prayed at 4 a.m. Consistently attended church and did all these good works. And they said they were not saved. But then they were regenerated and born again and received the Holy Spirit. So again, don't think because you pray that you're saved. There are a lot of cults that pray like Muslims, the religion of Islam, Jehovah Witness, Mormons. These are some praying and fasting people, and they are not born again. So remember to be born again. This is John chapter 3. Number 7, read your Bible. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, that the Bible is spiritual in nature. It says that unless you be born again, you cannot understand the Bible because the Bible is a spiritual book in its nature. So the word of God is foolishness to those who are perishing, but is light to all those who are in Christ Jesus. There have been so many times where I have read a scripture, I have prayed the scripture, and it has taken me into prayer and worship. So the Bible and its nature, just by reading it, it is strengthening your spirit, man. And so, again, this is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that the word of God is profitable for reproof, correction, doctorate, and instruction in godliness. And so it just takes you into prayer and worship. And it says, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, says, Study to show yourself approved, rightly divide in the word of truth, a workman that need not to be ashamed, right? So the word of God empowers you and makes you emboldened. And it is so powerful. I actually have a demonstration of how you could be overcome by the spirit of God just by reading or reciting the word of God, right? Number six, pray out loud. <laughs> we need to get comfortable by praying out loud. So this is Isaiah chapter 58. It says that, and this scripture is about fasting, but it says cry aloud and spare not, right? So we've actually lost that in Western <laughs> civilization where we are overcome by a spirit of fear. But again, second Timothy verse one, chapter one, verse seven, God has not given the spirit, the given us a spirit of fear, but power and love in the sound mind. It is very important for us to overcome fear and cry out. Again, it says to worship the Lord your God and to love him with all your strength, right? So we can scream, cheer, dance, yell for concerts, sporting events, and movies, all these things that do not matter in eternity, right? But we're very shy when it comes to God. And what that shyness is, is just sin, idolatry, and the fear of man, right? And so if I have that type of affection for God that I have for all these things that don't matter, it will come out of me. It says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So we have to follow, well, our words just follow where our heart is. <laughs> and so... If we are in the word of God and we follow the word of God, it will just come out of us through the Holy Spirit. Because again, this is 
John chapters 14, 15, and 16, it says that the Holy Spirit will bring in remembrance all that Jesus has said. So all the scripture should be coming out of us if we're born again, having the Holy Spirit, and he will lead us how to pray. So ask the Holy Spirit how to pray and he will help. Number five, pray the word of God. So there are four different parts of prayer that you can go into. So this is Philippians chapter four. It says that entering his courts with thanksgiving is one. Petition, supplication, and intercession. It says be anxious for nothing, but through prayer, supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving, make your petition known unto God that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will overtake your mind and your heart. And so there is a depth in prayer just following what the word of God says. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says that if we want spiritual gifts and also chapters 13, that we should ask of God. And so 1 John chapter 5 says, we know when we pray, we have anything that we ask according to his will. So if I pray the word of God, I am automatically in his will when I apply the scriptures rightly. There are scriptures that are for Christians universally. It doesn't matter the time or the author or anything. It is for Christians, right? So John 10 says that all that call on the name of the Lord sh shall be saved. Yeah, that's John chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you are saved. These are universal verses, right? But some verses are prophecy about Jesus, right? So that's Psalms 91. It is prophesying about his coming, what will happen to him. Or some are for the children of Israel. And so we have to apply the word of God rightly. So this is, it says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? So if I think that every scripture applies to me, my life will crash. My life will be torn asunder. So like Jeremiah 29 and 11, the plans I have for you are good, not to hurt or harm for you, but for a future right? This scripture is God talking to the children of God, the Jews at the time, the children of Israel, telling them that they are going to be placed into slavery for 70 years, right? But if I want to apply that scripture to all my prayers, like anything that happens to me is only going to not harm me, but be for a hope for a future, I'm going to pray amiss. So this is James chapter 4. It says that you have not because you ask not. You ask and do not receive because you pray amiss to consume it upon yourself in your own lusts and desires, right? So part of praying the scriptures is praying in context. And so just remember the rule of one and one. Read one book of the Bible at a time one chapter at a time, one verse at a time, and every day pray at least one hour and read at least one chapter of the Bible. You will be fine and you will not go astray. Number four, when you pray, include silence, stillness, and solitude. So one of the great revivalist books that you should read is The Life of God and the Soul of Men by Henry Scruple. And in the book is a very interesting section where it talks about being born again, prayer, regeneration. It says that when you are not truly saved, one of the fruits of that is high study in the mind, right? And outward works. So one of the fruits of not actually being saved when it comes to your spiritual life and your prayer life is that you're going to want to study the Bible a lot and then do all these great things and not pray, right? So a lot of outward displays 
and intellectual properties that puffs up. It says knowledge puffs up, right? But he says that a fruit, intimacy in prayer is stillness, right? So the opposite of all those outward works is being still, waiting on the Lord, and also silence. So that's humility, right? So one of the parts of prayer is listening. Now, again, you're not listening to random voices because you will go astray and go amiss because you have your old flesh, you have your own desires, and you also have the devil and his demons. So the Bible doesn't teach us to listen to voices because you will fall into the spirit of delusion, which is written out in Romans chapter one. It says God has given them over to a reprobate mind. You will go crazy trying to listen to random voices. So again, this is John chapter 14, 15, and 16, that the Holy Spirit will bring it to remembrance, all the scriptures um, to you. So the gospel will keep you very solid in prayer. But remember, get still. We have such a busy life. We're so overstimulated through social media and through a whole bunch of podcasts, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, our life is so detrimental to the Christian walk. And so this is why it's called a Christian walk is slower in pace, right? And so it's just like a, a good relationship, right? When you are close to someone, you don't have to say that much, but when you actually are afar from someone and you are not intimate, you have to actually talk a lot. You actually over talk. And so you need to be comfortable with, hey, you already did prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, intercession. You have poured out your soul unto God, right? Wait for his response. And his response will align in the scriptures. <laughs> and so a lot of times we burn ourselves out in prayer because there's different types of prayer, like intercession. You're praying for other people. <laughs> so this is what Paul Washer said. He said, prayer should not be hard, but when you pray and intercede, that's going to be hard. And so if you have thanksgiving, if you just change your prayer from asking God for the salvation of our other people, but praying for all that God has already done on the cross, all you see in the scriptures, there's actually an ease and a lightness in prayer, right? When you rest in his goodness. See right now, I'm getting overtaken. I'm just talking about the goodness of God and the spirit of God is being stirred in me because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me, right? But again, I'm alone. <laughs> I know the word of God and I have the Holy Spirit. I'm born again. And so the fruits of the Holy Spirit, like joy, right? is overtaking me right now, even though I'm not even praying, but I am becoming prayer. And so this is the importance in your prayer life. Have consistency. Have a consistent time in the morning. Have a consistent time at night. <laughs> Have it cornered off and don't allow anybody to interrupt it. And also want to put in this quote from Charles Spurgeon that was pretty interesting when he has his sermon on YouTube about prayer. He said, how you know that a person is truly not praying, they say they are always praying as they go about their day. A person who is truly in prayer has a consistent dedication, time, and place of prayer. So this is Psalms like walk. He who abides in the secret place of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. Or Matthew chapter 6 says that when you pray, enter into your closet and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So Matthew chapter 6 already teaches us how to pray, to be still, to be silent, and to be secluded alone, right? So this is how you actually get intimate with God. You're not saying, oh, I'm always praying to God, but are you always listening? Number three, it says in the scriptures that the fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. Pray fervently. So what does that mean? You need to pray with passion. And so 
we're just going to be honest. We pray very half-hearted prayers as if it's some type of task that we need to check off our box, right? But when you're in desperate need of something, you pray with some effort, right? So again, John chapter four says, God's looking for those who will worship in spirit and in truth. And so part of praying in the spirit, that is Ephesians chapter five, it says edify yourself in, in hymns and spiritual songs. So as you're praying in the Holy Spirit, right? So what is praying in the Holy Spirit? Praying in the Holy Spirit can be praying the scriptures. Praying in the Holy Spirit is praying in the language that you know, wherever the Holy Spirit is leading you to pray, right? Or praying in the Holy Spirit could be praying in the gift of tongues. But I want to say that I have prayed in the Holy Spirit and have been overcome. And being overcome by the Holy Spirit is called travail. All right, I need y'all to understand this. There is a depth in prayer that you need to hit that is not regular prayer. I'm telling you, everybody who has hit it before knows exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to travail. We grow accustomed to those little half-hearted prayers that we had in church that is not travail. I want to give you one of the examples from the Bible. So the Holy Spirit brought one of the names of God. So I have a list of the names of God on the sheet, right? And so I was praying the name of God just over and over again. I remember it. I really believe it was Jehovah Shikinu, right? Again, I was praying in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit gave me a Bible verse, God's name, Jehovah Shikinu, the Lord, our righteousness. And so this Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, to proclaim liberty to the captive, the opening of the prison to all that are bound, right? And so if you continue on in chapter 61 of Isaiah, it says he has given me the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, right? So that entire scripture is about Jesus, right? And the glory that he will come in, but it's also about us when we get born again. And so beauty for ashes is a promise and the robes of righteousness is our garment of praise, right? So when I'm praying God's name, Jehovah Shikinu, the Lord, our righteousness, I'm just praying that, praying that, praying that. I got some soft worship music in the background, however, I get overcome by the Holy Spirit and I began weeping, right? And so this is second Corinthians chapter seven. It says like what real repentance looks like. And part of real repentance is that fervency in prayer, right? Where it's just this cleansing, this beauty, it's, it's really beautiful, right? And so there was something about that scripture, Jehovah Shikinu, the Lord, our righteousness, and understanding that Jesus finished work on the cross, he has gifted us his righteousness. But I didn't know that at the time, I am just saying the Lord's name. And so I entered into travail, right? And so I cannot say that there's an exact time limit for travail, but I will say this. I haven't found travail early. I was in maybe an hour, two hours of prayer and worship until I actually hit that, right? And so I don't know how long it takes, <laughs> but it's not something that you can just rush. But again, you have to be for it in prayer. You have to have a zeal. You have to have a passion for it. You have to have a love, right? And so Jesus talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, a more perfect way and love is that more perfect way. And so this is why I said, start at the cross, the love of God shed abroad for us on the cross. And so it should take, take you into fervence and just a passion in prayer. So that word fervent means fire, passion, right? And so you definitely want to pray with fire. Don't pray half-hearted, cold prayers. And use this measuring rod for prayer. 
Was that cold or was that fire? Number two, when you pray, pray with others. It says that Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes hearing, hearing by the word of God. Um, Psalms chapter 34, worship the Lord with me, like come worship together. And I think it's Psalms 134, I might be wrong, but it says unity. Nope, it's Psalms chapter 1, 119. It says unity commands the blessing. And so this is also in the book of Matthew. Whoops. It says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst. So one of the things that we've actually lost oftentimes is that we've lost unity in prayer, right? And so when I said faith comes hearing, hearing by the word of God, if I hear something in prayer that's led by the Holy Spirit, it will be confirmed in two or three witnesses. It says, let every word of God be confirmed by two or three witnesses in First Corinthians chapter 14. So this has to be how you can test if you're actually praying according to the Holy Spirit. And if you have mature believers in God, they can tell you like, hey, that's not from the Bible that conflicts with scripture or the Holy Spirit also told me that separately, right? So make sure when you do this, do not have confirmation bias. So there's a lot of flattery in the fear of man, idolatry, when it comes to prophecy and when it comes to prayer. And so part of being mature is how the Bible has listed out the church to operate when it comes to Ephesians chapter four, apostles, teachers, prophets, evangelists, and pastors for the building up of the church, right? So part of that is saying like, hey, you're hearing wrong, what you said is not from God or that is from God or the Holy Spirit also told me this. And I had a confirmation bias trying to pick out things and try to interpret things when you can be hearing the voice of the devil, the demons, or something else, right? So I will, I will take this from Charles Spurgeon. And he said, when you pray, you don't have to worry. Definitely have discernment have discernment, have discernment, right? And so part of that discernment is knowing that if I'm going to Bible, I'm born again, and I'm asking God specifically, then he hears me when I pray. And so this can be confirmed in multiple witnesses. It says in the multitude of people, there is safety, right? And also in Matthew, it says that whatever is heard in the dark shall be seen in the light, right? So if you're hearing anything from God that you believe is from God, and that voice that you think is from God is saying, don't tell, right? Wait or whoever, right? Don't believe that voice. Anything that you say, God said, you could tell other Christians, you could tell leadership, you could tell elders, but if you think something's from God and no one else besides you can confirm it and you're looking from confirmation everywhere, that is omens. The Bible says to stay away from that. It says it's a wicked and perverse generation that seeks after a sign. How you can actually test if something actually is from God is Romans chapter four. It says every word that God has spoken, he will perform it. If it actually comes from God, it will happen. If it doesn't happen, it wasn't from God. And so stay safe out here. There's a bunch of weird stuff on the internet. And a great book on the subject is The Gifts and Ministries of the Holy Spirit by Lester Summerall. Amazing book, how to know if something actually is coming from the Holy Spirit or actually not. All the books and all the scriptures I'm listing below in the description box to click it. Lastly, number one, when you pray, Pray the Lord's Prayer that is listed out in Matthew chapter 6 and also what he says about fasting. So you have an entire Bible, but you have an entire chapter on prayer. And so this manner of prayer is very important because it says that we must ask God. Remember, Jesus is our Lord. We are not God. We are finite. We are 
are able to die, we <laughs> need to ask God because he is sovereign. And sovereign means that he is in command. He runs things. <laughs> and so the Lord's prayer is very humble in nature and the different components, again, pray the Lord's prayer, but the different attributes of the Lord's prayer is the posture of how we actually are supposed to approach God. Remember? So it says, our Father who art in heaven. And so it takes the focus off of us and focuses on the church, the promises that we are children of Abraham. So we have his promise. And so again, the promise isn't for the individual because the Bible is not about us, but we are a collective body, our father. And so it focuses on God first. Oh, man, the Lord's prayer is such a great template for prayer. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God says, I am holy. God starts off with his holiness. If you behold Jesus, you are transformed in a twinkling of an eye. You can behold him in the scriptures or you can behold him on the cross or behold him in his coming in his glory. We want to know what it looks like, but when I think on these things, think on these things that are high and above and are lovely and are pure and are just and of a good report, think on these things. Boom. I am overcome and I have the mind of Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He is holy first and foremost. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth, it is in heaven. Again, prayer is not about us. So when I pray God's will, right, that his kingdom will come, what does his kingdom look like? All the scriptures list out for me what that kingdom looks like. You know, how he will come in power and authority. And Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. I can know his will. It's not, God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God does not take any pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, but that he shall repent and live. So that's Ezekiel, John, and I'm just going off the top of the head, right? I'm that template of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter six is just taking me so deep in wisdom and revelation right now that the Spirit of God is just leading. And so, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember, earth and heaven is going to pass away, and there will be a new kingdom and a new heaven that is coming in Jesus' second coming. Kingdom come will be done on earth and in his heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, right? So it says in scriptures that life has enough problems. So this is Luke chapter 12. I think it's Matthew chapter six. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. And so it says that Jesus is the bread of life and the Bible is the word of God and the bread of life. And so it says, when we come together, we should take communion, the body of Christ being the bread and the blood being his New Testament. By his stripes, we are healed. So we are cleansed from all unrighteousness, all sin, all iniquity, and we are forgiven. As by grace, the grace of God, unmerited favor that these gift of eternal life was given unto us that no man should boast is a free gift of God. And through faith, we believe on his finished work on the cross. Give us today our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We look towards God's second coming through Jesus Christ. And we know that we have an expected end that all those who are lit in, written in the Lamb's book of life, shall not die and not perish, but have everlasting life. We shall live forever in his kingdom, for we are kings and priests listed out in Revelation chapter 5. Give us a day of our daily bread. Give us a day of our Father, which are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And give us a day of our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. So and this is the call of God on us. It says that we are ambassadors of Christ put into the ministry of reconciliation as we have been reconciled to God. So sin had forever separated us from God. And it says the wages of sin is death in James, but the free gift of God is eternal life, right? So when we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? So God is holy. Remember, he is perfect. There's no evil in him. There's no shadow or darkness in him or shadow of eternity. And so God says, be perfect as he is perfect, right? It's like, wow, how can I be that perfect? It says, my righteousness, my goodness, every good thing I do is filthy rags. It is menstrual bleeding compared to the holiness and perfection of God. And so Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life. So he didn't have any wages on him. So he could not die. His body could not see corruption. Uh, but it said that he became sin, taking on our sins unto himself. And it says, this curse is every man who hangs from a tree, breaking the power of a curse. So every sin that we sin against another person, that's transgression. We sin in action, that's a sin, or sin in heart, right? Our desires, our emotions, our thoughts, that's iniquity, right? We have sinned against God. We have sinned against a holy God. And so that means that we are deserving of judgment. We're deserving of wrath. We're deserving of hell. And so we enter into the ministry of reconciliation because when we were separated from God, his holiness and your sinfulness, he has atoned for it on the cross. And so he paid the ransom. So that means his blood has covered but also he has made us one with him once more. And so this is how we enter into as ambassadors of Christ, telling others that they can also become children of God by telling them what Jesus has already done on the cross, according to his scriptures, through his death, burial, and his resurrection from the dead. This is day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This ending is so perfect. It says, for thine is the kingdom. Again, the perspective is not on us. It is all about God. Seated on the throne, high and lifted up. Seated on the mercy seat, the judgment seat. Thine is the kingdom, the power. Every good thing, every power is his power. It says that all the world and the force there points to his glory. Everything that we see, everything that I am, everything I can hope to be is God's. There is nothing in me that's not his, not my breath, not my hair, not my possessions, not my life, not my will, not my emotions, not my wife, not my friends, not anything belongs to me. It all belongs to God. All the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. All goodness comes down from the Father of lights. It says, every good thing comes from God, comes down from the Father of lights. If anything is truly from God and it's good, it comes strictly from the hell. There's no good in us at all. There's not one good, not one. And amen. Let it be so. The Lord's prayer is so powerful. And so if the Bible says, when you pray, pray like this. When you fast, fast like this. So, Pray and fast according to the chapter on prayer, and you will be good. So that's everything you have to know. Bible verses that will help you with prayer and worship and everything that I listed today will be below. And I want y'all to go into Isaiah 6, Revelation chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 61, Isaiah chapter 53, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, James chapter 5, and 1 Kings chapter 8. Those verses will teach you how to pray and how to worship God. And if you want a good Bible, also check out the New King James Study Bible and the Logos Bible software. If you think that you are actually called to do any good work 
for the Lord, and you will get $100 off Logos Bible software. And there's a link to all the resources like How to Worship a King by Zach Neese and The Life of God and Soul of Man by Henry Schoolwell below. So thanks for watching and check out this next video about how to fast right now.